Hi guys, my name is Jack, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Dangerous Connections. There are crimes that at first glance are difficult to assess unambiguously. On the one hand, the law of any state guarantees the inviolability of life and health of every person. In contrast, it is often opposed by the testimony of witnesses who minimize the guilt of the attacker. One such controversial case was the crime that occurred in the Mullenix family. Let's try to make sense of it together. Let's find out the reasons for the tension and weigh the responsibility of each person involved. Could it be that the victim is far from innocent? Or is her executioner a wolf in sheep's clothing? An unexpected discovery. On September 14, 2006, Newport Beach was troubled. A woman's body was discovered in a body of water. Apparently, the corpse had been wrapped in a sheet and then placed in a box. When exposed to the water, the unreliable wrapping fell apart and exposed what should have been hidden from view. The body floated to the surface after being in the water for no more than a day. Normally, warm water would speed up the decomposition process. Therefore, the appearance of the dead left much to be desired. Forensic medical examination established. The cause of the woman's death was multiple stab wounds. In total, she received about 52 blows, one of which came directly to the eye. Specialists agreed that the injuries were caused by three different knives, which means there were at least two people who attacked the victim. Naturally, the victim had no identification on her, so the police had to work hard to find out her identity. Among the missing, the profile of the woman was not listed, and no new disappearances have been reported so far. Everything pointed to attempts to cover up the crime committed. Experts also determined that the woman had resorted to plastic surgery during her lifetime. She had breast augmentation. Since the identification of bodies by serial number of implants became a routine procedure, the identity of the murdered was soon established. She was 56-year-old Barbara Mullenix. Who is Barbara Mullenix? The future Mrs. Mullenix was born on May 29, 1950 in Munich, Germany. In her youth, she was very beautiful and sociable. Therefore, she was always in the center of attention. However, these qualities brought her not only success with the opposite sex, but also caused her a lot of trouble. At the age of 18, she was subjected to violence. The girl wanted to forget as quickly as possible what happened. But after a while, she learned about the pregnancy. To make an abortion, Barbara did not become, she decided to bear the child and give it to a good family. After a while, she got married. In the marriage, she gave birth to a son, Alex Hagwood. However, the marital relationship with her first husband did not last long. At the age of 35, Barbara's attention was attracted by Bruce Mullenix. The man recalled that she was a special woman and immediately liked him. She was characterized by straightforwardness and self-confidence. In November 1987, the couple married. Mr. Mullenix was younger than his wife for nine years, but it was not particularly felt. Barbara knew how to arouse interest and liked to have fun. After moving to Oklahoma City, a daughter, Rachel, was born to the family. Everything was fine at first, but as time went on, problems began. In the evenings, Bruce could skip on a mug of beer and on weekends to drop in on friends. Barbara at first supported the company, but later became addicted to alcohol. Apparently, the events that occurred in her youth left their imprint. Under the influence of alcohol, the woman, despite the parents' relationship with each other, they loved their daughter very much. They spoiled her and tried to please her in every way. While living in Oklahoma, before the divorce, Rachel had a large room while her father and mother lived in a small one. On the occasion of the girls' birthday parties were always held in the house. Miss Mullenix recalled that she was very close to her mother, even more so than most mothers and daughters. But such a close bond existed only when the woman was sober. The rest of the time, Rachel tried to stay away from her, made no attempt to even talk to her. Our relationship was generally good, but when Barbara drank, she got angry and crazy. She was the first one to get into a fight. Bruce confirmed what his daughter said. Since the house Mullenixoff was located near Hollywood, Barbara was in an extraordinary delight. She loved movies, especially singled out 
gone with the wind. A short time after the move, the woman managed to get a job as an extra. Hollywood dream come true. She felt that in time she would be offered a more serious role. But for now, together with her daughter, took an active part in the masses in movies and TV shows. The scene of the crime was established. Who is the culprit? Police officers could not understand why none of the relatives did not report the disappearance of the murdered woman. Soon, police officers Steve Mack and Joe Cartwright obtained a search warrant for Barbara's home. They hypothesized that since the woman was wrapped in a sheet, the crime could have occurred in bed. So the search for evidence had to begin at Mrs. Mullenix's residence. The police found no one at Barbara's house. At first glance, everything seemed to be in order. There were no visible signs of a crime. However, in one of the rooms on the second floor, a disassembled bed attracted attention. It was without a mattress. It only took a couple hours to reconstruct the scene. The detective's assumptions had a real basis. Specialists found traces of blood on the walls. Somebody went to a lot of trouble to get rid of the evidence. The blood-stained mattress had apparently been destroyed. There was no doubt that the crime had taken place in this place. The police also believed that the owner of the house knew the perpetrator. Therefore, the first suspect was Mr. Mullenix. It was a strange coincidence that the man was out of town. In addition, just the day after the body was discovered, Bruce returned home. He explained that he was worried because his wife and daughter were not answering their phone calls. The man, of course, had a premonition of something wrong, but in no way expected to hear such a thing. Nevertheless, the news of Barbara's terrible death, the former spouse took it calmly. This also alerted the detectives so they began to investigate the reason for his departure. Bruce said he was on a business trip. Mr. Mullenix's management confirmed his alibi. The investigation was back to square one. Daughter's love. When Rachel turned 17 years old, she met with Ian Allen. The guy was older than the girl by four years. Young people fell madly in love with each other. Ian supported Rachel in everything, even helped with household chores. At first, Barbara liked him. They even spent time together. They went for walks together. They went out together. In order for the lovers to meet freely, Rachel's parents got a special permit. Apparently, so required by law and police officers. Law enforcers often drew attention to the non-standard couple. The girl was allowed to be absent until one o'clock in the morning, but she often violated the established schedule, for which she was repeatedly under house arrest. After a while, Mrs. Mullenix noticed that her daughter's feelings were growing into something more. To make matters worse, the two announced that they had decided to get engaged. The move seemed too quick to Barbara. Ian and Rachel had only known each other for three months. Barbara didn't want to lose her daughter and the payments she received from her ex-husband. Barbara decided to increase her influence and discipline. Rachel was caught between two fires. She didn't want to offend her mother whose control was only increasing. Ian, in turn, did not give way. So her mother and Ian began to compete for Rachel's attention. Rachel's fragile psyche suffered with every quarrel and altercation that arose between them. By the end of the summer of 2006, Ian and Barbara's relationship finally deteriorated. The younger Alan was afraid that Rachel's mother would convince her not to date him or forbid her from doing so at all. One day, when Rachel once again violated her schedule for coming home, Barbara exploded. Despite the late hour, Mrs. Mullenix headed to the boyfriend's house and made a scandal. This situation really offended and angered Ian. It became clear to everyone that it couldn't go on like this. On the trail of the fugitives, Bruce was no longer suspected of killing his ex-wife. Detectives turned their attention to Rachel and Ian, Police found out that Barbara had been feeling lonely lately and was drinking a lot. It made her inadequate. Her daughter's attention was slipping away from her. She considered Ian an unworthy companion and Rachel a traitor. That's why Mrs. Mullenix often quarreled with them. Besides, no one knew where the lovers were. They never contacted each other. Given the complicated relationship between Barbara and Ian, the girl's father assumed that Ian was a criminal who was being sought. Rachel, in all likelihood, is not safe either. Otherwise, she would have made herself known, Mr. Mullenix pondered. The police began searching for the missing persons. 
The Allen's house was also searched. When the detectives checked Ian's computer, they found curious queries on the internet. The guy was researching the route of transportation to the city of Tampa, which is located in Florida. Bruce remembered that before moving in with him, Barbara and Rachel lived there. The couple was reported missing. All police stations in the country received bulletins with a description of the appearance of young people. In addition, the alleged suspect did not disappear without a trace. He left a decent trail behind him. Ian Allen's credit card was used to make a purchase at a gas station in Louisiana. That's also where a surveillance camera captured the guy's truck. Mr. Mullenix's fears were confirmed. Rachel was indeed with him. The only thing left to do was to intercept them. So officers Steve Mack and Joe Cartwright called their colleagues from the next town on the couple's route. Local police shut down highways in search of the van. Ian Allen and Rachel Mullenix were soon caught. The kidnapping story. Do you know I've been kidnapped? Rachel shouted when apprehended. What right did you have to arrest me, to throw me on the ground in handcuffs? She continued. I'm not a criminal for you to treat me like this. Detectives Joe and Steve waited for the moment when they could finally question the couple. Two days later, they arrived at a Louisiana police station. Miss Mullenix insisted that she had not killed her mother. Once investigators pressed the girl, she blamed it on her boyfriend. Rachel claimed that Ian killed her mom and afterwards forced her to run away with him. The police asked for more details about what happened on September 13, 2006. I woke up to hear noises in the house. Then I realized that my mother was screaming a lot and calling for help. I rushed to her room. What I saw shocked me. Ian had attacked my mom with a knife. He was stabbing her over and over again. I jumped on him, tried to push him away. He was very strong, so he easily fought me back. I couldn't believe what was happening. I was in a kind of stupor. Rachel began her story. Afterwards, she added that the boyfriend forced her to help cover her tracks. He also insisted that she pack her mother's belongings into bags. Rachel claimed that by doing so, Ian wanted to stage Barbara's unexpected departure. At first, the detectives wanted to believe the girl. The shock she'd been through could send anyone into a state of frustration. But for some reason, the witness to the crime was overly justified. And afterwards, she fiercely insisted that she was not involved in the crime. Furthermore, there were no signs of resistance on Rachel's body. When communicating with Ian Allen, police officers found out an interesting fact. His girlfriend from time to time told about how hard it is for her to live with her mother, how intemperate the woman behaves when she drinks. Instead of reconciling the rivals, Rachel only increased Ian's negative feelings. Certainly some of the facts were true, but some of them were clearly exaggerated. That was why Ian was finally convinced that Barbara would not let them rest. Sometime after the night's quarrel at the Allen house, holding a grudge against Barbara, the lad headed for the Mullenix house. Rachel was under house arrest. I wanted to see her. I knew Barbara wouldn't let me in to see her, so I came secretly. I wanted to sneak into her room quietly, but Barbara spotted me. We got into an argument that escalated into threats. With the folding knife I always carry, I decided to scare her. As soon as the blade was at Mrs. Mullenix's throat, she started screaming. This made me angry and provoked an attack. Things got out of control. It wasn't supposed to happen like that. Rachel really had nothing to do with it, Ian said about the incident. To the surprise of the investigators, the guy did not try to avoid responsibility and confess to everything. Over time, Detectives became increasingly convinced that Rachel Mullenix was directly involved in the crime. Her boyfriend was clearly covering for her. CCTV footage from the gas station convenience store where the couple had stopped was scrutinized. Rachel was walking around the store looking for groceries. At that point, she could have safely called for help or run away. But for some reason, she didn't. Moreover, as it turned out later, the girl had the opportunity to call her father but preferred to make a call to her friend. It was found that a couple of hours after the crime, Miss Mullenick sent a message to Ian Allen. I love you, she wrote in her text. And that's how Rachel finally lost the trust of the investigation. Rachel's defense. 
It took two years to gather and analyze all the evidence in the Barbara Mullenix murder case. During that time, Rachel turned 19 years old. For any other girl, that's a great age. There is a whole life ahead of her. For young Mullenix, her future depended on the jury's verdict, and she tried to convince everyone of her innocence. When Rachel talked about her childhood, her face lit up. It was obvious that the tender years were happily spent. No doubt Barbara and Bruce had tried to make them so, despite many circumstances. Recalling the relationship with her mother, the daughter said that they were good. They were marred only by alcohol, which was abused by the murdered woman and the boyfriend who appeared over time. At school, I was known as a girl from a not very prosperous family with alcoholic parents. When my father drank, he was still himself. He was kind and considerate, which can't be said for my mom. She described the family atmosphere in court. Her words were confirmed by her friend, Kelsey Douglas, who often visited the Mullenix family. Kelsey said that Rachel always tried to please her mother in everything, but apparently there came a point when she could no longer tolerate the harsh control and insults. She admitted to me that she had started drinking from time to time. Rachel didn't know what else to do. She had nowhere else to turn. The alcohol helped relieve tension, to forget for a while about family difficulties, Miss Douglas reported. Alex, Rachel's older brother, strangely enough, also stood up for Rachel. He considered her a victim rather than a murderer. That's why he refused to believe in her guilt to the last. He told the court that his sister had been a good and obedient child. She did well at school, practiced sports and ballet. As for the relationship between Barbara, Rachel, and Ian, Alex noted that at first they were great. All three spent a lot of time together. Barbara's eldest son also reported that their mother abused alcohol and illegal substances before her death. She took stimulants and tranquilizers and often threw loud parties. When Barbara realized that Rachel and her boyfriend wanted to distance themselves, she couldn't accept it. In addition, she found it difficult to get by on her own without alimony and maintenance money. All of this became a source of irritation. According to Alex, Mrs. Mullenix was a very controlling woman. She wanted to be in control of everything. With Rachel, she certainly went overboard in this. My mother loved to be the center of attention. With Ian coming into Rachel's life, her position shifted to the side, Alex summarized. In the involvement of his daughter in the murder of Barbara could not believe and the girl's father. He believed that she loved her mother very much and was incapable of hurting her. In all the time, Rachel did not accuse her mother of the weaknesses that were peculiar to her. She simply reported them as a fact. The girl repeatedly stated that she felt sorry for her. Barbara had a difficult life. About the relationship of her parents, Miss Mullenix recalled with bitterness. Rachel said that the slightest details in the behavior of his father drove his mother into a rage. Barbara often snapped at him, considered a spender. Rachel also told the court that she regretted her love for the young man. She made a big mistake when she started dating him. Their feelings brought discord to her relationship with her mother. Ian felt that my mom was a threat to him. He also wanted to control me like she did. My boyfriend wasn't ideal either often hurt and treated me like I was his property. I was torn between the two. Every time there was an argument with my mom, I shared about it. It made it easier for me to get over what happened, Rachel recalled. She concluded by adding that Ian did everything he could to prevent harm to what he thought was his. Prosecution's position. Sonia Balest, the prosecutor involved in the case, did not believe Rachel's story. She claimed that the girl's angelic appearance was deceptive because she thought she was already smart enough for her age. Therefore, the position Miss Mullenix had chosen was thoroughly refuted. The officers who investigated supported the prosecutor in this. Steve Mack and Joe Cartwright believed that Rachel had some mental health issues. According to them, she was the meanest girl they had ever spoken to. During the interview, the prosecutor competently appealed the inconsistencies in Miss Mullenix's testimony. She inquired of Rachel why she never once called for help when she could have done so, to which the girl replied that she was confused and did not know how to behave in such a situation. The defendant also added that she was frightened by Ian's behavior, which was difficult to predict. The prosecutor drew attention to the fact that Rachel had not a single chance to escape. 
The girl's actions were atypical for a kidnap victim. The prosecution believed that Miss Mullenix had not only attacked her mother herself, but had planned the crime in advance. When they tried to ask Rachel about the details of Ian's stabbing, Rachel was unable to answer. Her testimony changed and contradicted each other more than once. During the trial, the defendant stated that she was not present during the argument between Barbara and Ian. Allegedly, she simply left them in her room, hoping they would calm down. Only then did she hear screaming and the sounds of a struggle, after which she came running back and saw that the guy attacked her mom with a knife. However, Rachel's version did not coincide with the evidence that was found at the scene of the crime. The forensic report clearly established that Barbara's attacker was not alone. Specialists estimated that five minutes had been enough to kill the woman. Rachel continued to insist on her own innocence. Questions. Why she didn't call emergency services, why she wrote a love text to the killer boyfriend, were frozen in the air unanswered. The forensic psychiatrist who worked with Miss Mullenix diagnosed her with borderline personality disorder. He believed she truly loved her mother, but she hated her equally as much. By the way, people with this kind of personality are prone to erratic behavior. It's often destructive to both the unsub and others. Bitter verdict. It took the jury three days to reach a final verdict. Ian Allen was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. For Rachel Mullenix, the court's verdict was no consolation either. She was found to be involved in the death of her mother and qualified the act as first-degree murder. The girl was sentenced to life in prison. Her first chance for parole will come when the inmate turns about 41 years old. After the verdict was announced, the prosecutor said she was relieved. There is no question that Ian Allen and Rachel Mullenix killed Barbara, Sonia Balest concluded. For a mother, such a death was a true betrayal. The day Barbara brought her daughter into the world, she signed her own death warrant. The child she loved immensely became her light and darkness at the same time. Undoubtedly, Mrs. Mullenix made many mistakes in her life. She was not an ideal mother, but she never abandoned her children to perdition. Barbara's jealousy and fear of being alone hardened the woman's already strong character. But people in love always had a choice. They could simply leave to preserve their right to their feelings. In time, things would have calmed down. Relationships would have mended. Perhaps Barbara would have switched to something else. And the grandchildren Rachel and Ian would give her would be her outlet. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead.